Oops. Let me uh, move this a little bit. Balancing my phone on a plant right now, so you're good. There we go. I think. Yay! I can see you, nice and perfect. You can hear me, okay? Yeah, I can. Awesome. These are going great so far. For those that don't know, my name is Kate. I write for Guitar World. I have some new interviews coming up um, alongside Jax, actually. And we're going to start here on my new IG live series, Communicate. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, Jack has been very busy, so we're going to get into all of his cool projects. Um, so alongside country music and blues, uh, you're no stranger to folky acoustic sounds. Uh, yeah earlier that you're working on a new P EP, if you want to start there. And uh, tell me a little bit about how that's going. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I grew up uh, in South Carolina and um, we do, you know, grew up doing like bluegrass and a lot of like the Western swing kind of stuff. And, you know, I like all that stuff, you know, I grew up with it, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to do something uh, using the instruments, but not exactly that kind of sound, you know, more, you know, a fresher sort of <clears throat> modern sort of airy sound, you know, like more like the Civil Wars. Do you remember them? I do. Didn't they do something with Taylor Swift? They did. They did that song after the Hunger Games. Yeah. Oh, I was <clears throat> but I'm really into that, like, you know, mellow sort of acoustic thing that they do. So. Maybe you could even collab with them sometimes. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Did so, like a record or something? Yeah, yeah. No, Joy, Joy Williams, the, uh, the uh, you know, they broke up. I mean, they're still both doing things separately. Uh, doing solo stuff? Yeah, I mean, she she's truly amazing. Uh, she's probably my favorite uh, female vocal ever. So she's just Very really cool. I've definitely heard their music, and I'm sure they have a bunch of really cool solo projects going on, too, because, yeah. yeah, that sound is definitely in. Um. So will your instrumental album coming up uh, have any features of other players, speaking of other players, um, are you, or are you just creating all of it all by yourself? It, it's mostly going to be me. Um, there, there may be some others on there. Um, I'm kind of the guy that sort of got me into the chicken picking kind of stuff, you know. Um, I may have him on there. He's this player named uh, Scotty Anderson who you should really check out. I think he's, in my opinion, he's probably the greatest guitar player alive today. I mean, he's just... I'm just down, actually. Scotty Anderson. Yeah, Scotty Anderson. He's a Telecaster guy. Um, he's just, he's otherworldly. He's just, you know, he plays clean and, you know, very fast. I mean, his hybrid picking, he plays harmony, does all like the Chet Atkins kind of stuff and just blazing fast and just does all the right things in all the right places and you know if the man's ever made a mistake playing guitar i haven't heard it yet so wow i definitely gotta check him out then i'm surprised i have not checked out his stuff um and speaking of uh all the stuff that you're working on with your ep and your um instrumental album you're a busy guy because alongside your solo projects you help manage norman's rare guitars which is located right. California. Uh, the shop is iconic and is home to many high-end guitars, such as the 1971 uh, Fender Telecaster. We were just talking about a telly guy. Uh, and a 1930 Martin OM-28. I hope I'm yeah, pronouncing okay. it right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got some really um, great ones here right now. I mean, we've got a 52 Fender Telecaster. Um, uh, this one is mine. This is a 54. It's one of the original 5,000 Telecasters ever made. I, I love that's um, but uh, you know, I mean, we've got a '55 Les Paul Gold top in right now. Just some really, Les really, really great stuff. So, yeah, I saw so many wondrous things, especially the bases. You guys have the craziest bases in your shop. What What would you say is your all time favorite guitar that's ever come into that shop? Probably a hard question. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. It's probably. It's not even a guitar. It's, it's we still have it though. It's a 1923 uh, Gibson F5 mandolin. It was a, a Lloyd Lore mandolin, which is the most valuable you know one ever made. Um, it's uh, basically like the Stradivarius mandolins. You know, there's not many. I mean, 
it's the one we have is for sale, but it's $145,000. So it's so pretty much an expensive house, more or less. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I had the pleasure of jamming with you in person. Uh, we talked about hybrid picking. I believe you just brought that up. Uh, and that's one of the first things that I noticed about you was your excellent uh, hybrid picking. Thanks. What age did you start that? And were you self-taught? Or is there any teacher that you'd like to shout out? Because you were seriously insane, insane with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Take I, I'm ne no, I never had like a formal lessons or anything. There was this guy... Um, in my hometown, he was like probably the best guitar player there. And was still one of the best I've ever known. This guy named Jimmy Rogers, he owned a music store. And I always noticed when he played. Now, he didn't do like the chicken pig and stuff. He was like more of the uh, sort of, you know, let's see. sort of western swing stuff you know yeah got... that's so cool so i cannot believe that you you've done like so much of this by yourself yeah i mean you know you just like listen to people i mean you know like the country stuff you know the... <laughs> That kind of just stuff, you know. Woo! Oh my gosh. I love how you were like, and for the country stuff, you kind of just. <laughs> that is skill. That is straight up skill. You guys, please follow Jack if you have not yet. He is just so excellent. Thanks. Like I said, I had the opportunity to jam with him in person. I got to hear all of that, you know, right in front of me, which was, it was excellent. Absolutely excellent. Um, and I want to get into pedals and, and different kinds of gear. Uh, an overdrive pedal that has really impressed you recently is the Soul Drive from Shira X. Pedal. <laughs> um, tell me about the preamp tube inside and some other neat features. And I see that you have it right there, which is yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's got a 12AX7 preamp tube, which is like the most popular preamp tube that's in there. Um, it's a pretty you know, simple to operate pedal though. I mean, it's, you've got your volume, you know, your level here, and then obviously your gain and then your voice, which is kind of nice because, you know, depending on the amp and the speaker, you can kind of like shift and like cut, you know, hides or add hides to it. Um, that's what I've kind of gotten from it. And then there's like an obvious tone knob, but the voice to me works more like a presence knob, you know, like on an amplifier than anything. Um, it's a really, 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 just great pedal and Brian uh, Shire who has the company you know makes these pedals he's got some really cool stuff coming up um, he's um, actually got another company he was telling me the name of I can't remember right now but look him up at Shire effects on Instagram Shire yeah okay. it's, it's a very 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 um, cool uh, cool pedal so awesome I will actually, I will uh, send me the links for that because I'll put that in the description when I yeah. this, help shout them out a little bit. That'd be great. That's awesome. Um, I just cannot believe how busy you are. This is uh, epic, everything that you have in your endeavors. You're composing pieces for, um, or when you're composing pieces for film and television, what is your process for coming up with writing the guitar parts? Do you see the scene <laughs> and do you write over it or is it something that you do prior? How does that? No, I mean, you know, you got to like see what they're wanting, you know, and you, you have to kind of, kind of watch, you know, what they're doing. I mean, like if it's a, you know, a dramatic, sad scene, you know, some, you know, it, it's obviously sad as minor keys. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to like think about that. And then also, you know, the instrumentation. So it's not always like guitar, you know, I mean, I play like piano and, steel guitar and you know, mandolin and banjo a lot of other different instruments so i mean you know i mean even like violin and cello and all that stuff you know and you gotta like think about the mood i mean sometimes you know it's just a pad with you know some light strings and maybe like a really pretty open tuned acoustic guitar in the background doing some things you know or like some you know dissonant thing 
things. I mean, even something just like completely like off the wall. Like this. It just, you know, it creates, you know, that tension that you're looking for. And it's just, it's pretty cool. Uh-huh. For some reason, I feel like that riff could have been in Scooby-Doo just now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You, you know, it's just uh, or a like lot of things it could have been, you know, when they, like, realize, oh, crap, you know, it's the librarian who was doing all this stuff, you know? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. But it's, it's funny, though. I'm doing this, uh, this sh speaking of Scooby-Doo, I'm doing this uh, show. Um, it's like a variety show at this local bar here. Um, and, oh, my God. Uh, and we're this... We're doing it like uh, the, the second Thursday of each month. Um, we're gonna like feature different people, but one of the ladies that's coming, she's the voice for Daphne on Scooby Doo. She's been doing really? that for the past like twenty five years. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. That's so epic. Yeah. So. Wow, that's so cool, yo. Um, I feel like I have to write or ask you this question as somebody who writes because you write a ton of music with yeah. your team stuff, albums. EPs, uh, every musician has a different opinion on this. How important is music theory in your eyes? When it's it incredibly oh, important, I think. Incredibly important, okay. I mean, yeah. you know, you don't need to, you don't have to be some, you know, plethora, an encyclopedia of knowledge, but I mean, yeah. you know, it's, to me, it's important to at least understand, I mean, you know, you don't, if you don't want to be a modal player, that's fine. I, I don't use modes when I play. I oh, play yeah. what I, I play what I hear, you okay. know. And, and I mean, you know, like I pretty much, you know, I know what every note on the fretboard sounds like, so I know where to go to. I think the ear number one is your most important friend above all. Your ear. If you don't have an ear, you don't have anything. Like I just I hate to say it that way, but it's it's true. You know, a lot of guys like. When they play, it's they just learn their little positions, you know. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Now I can play guitar. Well, you can play a position, but, you know, you need to be able to go in and out of these positions pretty fluidly to do what you want to do. Right. Um, so, you know, I mean, th theory is very important. The most important theory, though, is chord theory. I really feel like you need to be able to build chords, dissect chords, do all the different inversions to really understand. I mean, chords are where everything is, you know. I mean, all the really greats of, like, the 20s and 30s, I mean, like, uh, you know, Freddie Green and, you know, all these, you know, Perry Bechtel is a really great banjo player. I mean, all these, Fred Astaire, you know, I mean, all these, like, you know, guys, they knew their chords. And it's just super important because your chords are what your whole song's based off of. So it's important to understand the relationship between the melody and the chords of the song. It's just super important. I mean, if you're like doing only original alternative music, then, you know, like Kurt Cobain, he didn't know anything, but he had a very successful career. But at the same time, Kurt Cobain couldn't have played in anybody else's band. Like Nirvana was it for him, you know? So it just depends on what you're wanting. You know, if you're just going to be an artist, and that's all, and you know you're going to make it big, and you're never going to need anybody else but yourself, then sure, you know, screw the theory. But if that's not the case, you probably should know some theory. I think you sound like a super smart dude, and, like, I think I would really actually benefit from smart ass, maybe, lessons but. with you, actually. Yeah, because, um, interestingly enough, I, I know the modes, and that was actually the first thing that I learned as a player from my teacher. So I know them up and down the neck and I can uh, move them around uh, as need be. But I, I learn off of patterns a lot of the times, yeah. like that kind of listening. And, and I do kind of rely on positions a lot, I got to say. And I would like to rely less on patterns and more on knowledge, if that makes sense. <laughs> it, it, it's just your ear. I mean, you know, even something as simple as, you know, they say that, you can't effectively improvise if you don't know how to harmonize the major skill. Just something as simple as. You got, you know, you really, you got to learn how to do it. Right on. Yeah.
Right on, right on. So everybody practice your theory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should, you, you should know it, I mean, enough to understand what you're doing. I mean, you know, it's just yeah. play, playing a bunch of random stuff can be very cool sometimes. I mean, sometimes if I'm like composing or scoring a piece, maybe it's just sometimes good just to hit the notes and see what happens. Mm -hmm. and that's cool, but that's not every time. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't yeah. want to only do that. You know, I think with music, you know, it's important to, you know, have like a good palette, and not just be a one trick pony. I mean, you know, like I've been recently experimenting with uh, quarter tones, which is what Middle Eastern, you know, what, you know, Eastern music is, you know, they have twice mm -hmm. as many notes as we do. Right. So, you know, that's like, you know, the sit the, the sitar, you know, and a lot of these other instruments, you know, like, it's, it's cool. I mean, to the average listener including myself you know a lot of it sounds terrible to me because my ears are not attuned to it i didn't grow up in that world you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and that's you know that's that's just it i mean you know it sounds great to them because they grew up in it but i'm trying to like expand my mind just you know a little bit because why not i mean you know you don't want to music is one of those things i don't i don't think you should ever want to be ignorant to it you know like art like you should never just say well the only good painters are the impressionists you know or the only good painters are the or the abstract art the only good artists are sculptors i mean that's the most ridiculous thing ever like you should appreciate all of it and you should at least strive to be able to have a conversation about it i think that's yeah. so many good quotes in there yes for sure like it's good to have a palette you know rather than just one thing and I totally agree. I think, like you said, depends what you want to do with your career, but to have at least a base so you can understand those patterns and apply it to a variety of things. I feel like right. as a, that's really important, especially when it comes to jamming, you know, <laughs> like sitting down with other artists and getting some music going. Yeah, uh, I mean, just a little bit at a time. I mean, you don't, you know, you can, you know, mm -hmm. and that being said, like, you can learn something from everybody. Even someone who has been playing for a few weeks probably can teach you something you didn't know because it's just, it's, it's limitless. Even if they're making a mistake when they're doing it, sometimes I'm like, I know you didn't mean to do that, but hold on a minute. That's kind of cool right there. No, yeah, that's interesting. Because like as a player that has been playing for many years, yourself you get to see new players and kind of go you get to see them developing their own style even if they don't know I exactly think, i think that's cool that's really neat so let's talk about live playing for a second back in august you shredded live at the norman's rare guitars jam in san fernando i believe san fernando valley yeah the san fernando valley yeah uh, for country music what are your favorite improv techniques or go-to licks when you're like in front of an audience do you have like go-to licks or is it just stuff that kind of <clears throat> I mean it's just kind of like what I'm feeling I mean you know there's there's a few little cool things like, there's this really cool revolving door lick that uh Brent Mason taught me I don't know if you know Brent Mason is but he um I he's do the second most recorded guitar player in history you know after Tommy Tedesco but he's about to beat Tommy though um mm -hmm. The slow version. Sped up. That's a cool little lick. Mm. Um, another one you know, that I learned from this uh, guy back home uh, named Doug Watson, great guitar player. That's a cool one. And then. Uh, One, one last one is like this really uh, steel guitar kind of thing. That's a cool one. one and then one other That's one is cool. That's cool. One more time. Mm. I don't know. 
There's some cool Fancy. stuff. Fancy. Yeah. That's awesome. I love your legs. Oh, thank you. Ambient stuff too. Ambient, ambient. I feel like everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's uh. Yeah, your acoustics. Are, I mean, like I said, guys, huge variety. If you're just tuning in, make sure to follow Jack. He uh, works at Norman. There's abs. <laughs> so make <laughs> show some love. Um, so back to gear. Every guitarist has a preferred guitar strap, and the best you've ever owned is from Legendary Vintage Belts. Uh, why is yeah. this your one? Why would you recommend oh. this to any guitarist out there? Show it to you. I saw my telly right here. Um, I mean, it's just hey. ridiculous. I mean, it's, you know, it's all studded. Everything's hand done. It's all, you know, just hand stitch. You know, you can see all the attention to detail, you know, even like, Hell yeah. like the back of the strap that you don't see. I mean, he's just, I mean, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. You know, the yeah. guy does such a fantastic yeah. job. His name is uh, Courtney, the guy that owns the, the business and he does it all by himself. Um, he's only about 10 minutes from me. Um, and I just, I discovered him cause I was doing a video with somebody and he like started following me and I'm like, dude, you make some great stuff. So, and I mean, it was a, you know, he gave me a great deal. I won't say what the deal is because I don't want to undercut his prices, but he's very reasonable though. So. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Strap like that. That does not look like a cheap strap. That no, it's very thick padded. Um, it's a leather strap. Now, I'm, I'm a big animal lover, to be honest. Like, you know, I, I'm not like a PETA guy, kind of guy, but like, I, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm very much against trophy hunting like period i don't like it I, I grew up in the south and i would you know even growing up i hated it it just wasn't my thing mm -hmm. um you know i'm one eighth cherokee indian so I, it's fine to eat animals if you want to do that you know i don't that's all well and good i just don't like killing them just to show them off but i say all that because you know it is a leather strap but he did not kill the cow to get the leather it was already a byproduct of getting the, the hive you know to make it but he does do like yeah vegan friendly straps or whatever um oh, so that's you know, if you want to do that he'll he'll do that as well so wow good businessman he's he's got yeah, a he, he, he's smart you know and it's and i've kind of i've kind of myself stopped eating a lot of meat there for a while for a few months i didn't eat it at all so i'm kind of teeter-tottering in between it so yeah all right hey so shout out to what is his name again? Should I put it in uh, my... Yeah, it's, it's just no. Legendary Vintage Belts. His name's Courtney. Courtney. So, yeah. I'll be sure awesome. to shout So shout out to Courtney. Yeah, shout absolutely. Cool piece today. So even though you play at super high speeds, your transition from phrase to phrase are pretty much seamless, as we just saw. I, I um, your picking hand and your fretting hand to work together so well to create these poetic sounding guitar lines because they really are just very seamless. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Did I get cut out? I might have gotten cut out a little About bit. half. About half? Okay, I think my question was in the second half. Um, how did you get your picking hand and your fretting hand to work together so well? Like, do you have any practice techniques that you can recommend? Um. Yes. Um, let's see here. I want to. I want to have to put this up a little higher. So, basically, for like the hybrid stuff, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I can play just a straight bit. You know. But if you want to do the hybrid stuff, I go pick finger, pick finger. You know, that's the way to do it. Just pick finger, pick finger, pick finger, pick finger, pick finger. Pick finger you know, practicing the, the harmonization of the scales to, um, and also, you know, even sort of uh, given the kind of Merle Travis sort of thing, a chance like a,
trying that. Um, what really helped me with the um, the hybrid picking, though, classical guitar is another good thing to work on, um, and uh, banjo. I play banjo and dobro and steel guitar, and that really helps, you know, because you got a thumb pick and then you're using these two fingers. So it's a lot of this. It's a lot of rudiments. You know what I'm saying? You kind of make me want to learn the banjo. Banjo is so much fun. Isn't it kind of like, um, I feel like that might even be a good starting point for picking like that, because isn't it a bit easier to play, a little bit easier to play? <clears throat> it is because you have to play it that way. There's no shortcuts. It's either right. do it or don't. And then you can just apply it to the guitar right, right. after. Right. Yeah, maybe I'll snatch myself a cheap banjo off of eBay or something. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't recommend it enough. It's a lot of fun, too. Nice. Um, I just brought our last question. So that went by uh, pretty fast, actually. So you guys, after this next one, I will open it up if anybody would like to ask Jack a question. Definitely feel free to do so. Yeah, and I can uh, show you my studio, too. I've got a lot of cards out here, too, if you want to see them, so. Yes, you were going to show me your studio. Um, so this last question was actually courtesy of Guitar World. They wanted to know, um, but if not, if you are not able to talk about it, that's okay. But are there any good celebrity stories or notable sales from Norman's Rare Guitar Shops, uh, if you're able to speak on them? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so I'm trying to think of some of my favorites. I mean, I, I love, there's so many great people. Um, let's see. Jack Black. Yes! Fantastic. Sweet guy. Black. The first time he ever went to the shop, I was working there, which was really cool. Um, did he buy anything? Like, did uh, he... Did yeah, he I, yeah, I believe we sold him this little small-bodied Gibson, uh, like a newer reissue thing. It was cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, Chris Martin from Coldplay. Wow, yeah. Uh, he brought his son in there, and uh, he... Uh, bought him a uh, thin line telecaster and they uh, reissued Deluxe luxury reverb so for his birthday you know which i'll be honest i thought was pretty cool i mean he you know he spent probably around three grand you know maybe 3500 bucks for that which is a lot of money and listen anybody would be happy to have that but he could if he wanted to have bought his son a 54 telecaster <laughs> and, sweet yeah. and, and all the pedals that he wanted and it wouldn't have been anything but he didn't, I, they don't spoil, like, you know, they treat, you know, they're good parents, but they're not like completely just ruining him. And I, to me, that was pretty doggone cool, I thought, you know, just seeing that they could, but they didn't, you know, and I feel like it's a really good parenting move on their part, you know, they got him something good that he can play and appreciate and learn on, but they didn't just completely ruin him. And I just, you know. I think I even told Chris that, you know, and it was it was so funny, though. Like, when Chris came in, I, by the way, he's actually a really tall dude. I always thought Chris Martin was going to be, like, short and small. And every, no, no, no. <laughs> he's, like, he's every bit as tall as I am, you know, which wow. that, that was interesting to me because I was, like, thinking, okay, I'm just going to meet this little Englishman. But no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> but when he came in, you know, he, like, you know, was talking about the guitar and stuff. And then Norm told him that I played mandolin and banjo, too. And he was like, you think we might could play some bluegrass music? And I'm like, yeah, we'll play some blues. So, I mean, we sat on the couch for about half an hour and just played through bluegrass songs. You know, I'm sitting there with <clears throat> the lead singer of Coldplay playing bluegrass. It was just the weirdest thing. But it's what he wanted to do. I didn't, I, I didn't know that he did play bluegrass. Yeah, he loves it. It's so funny. I mean, he just, he was like, he never... Wow has a chance to play it with anybody. I'm like, well, yeah, we'll play some bluegrass. That's super cool. And I, I think it's like an excellent move with their son too, because then as he learns, he can like get newer guitars and like- He can, you know, they just, they did the right thing there. I mean, there's, some, like, there's so many celebrities yeah. that come in there though. It's ridiculous. You know, it's hard to even like say who the coolest one is. I mean, you know, I mean, we've had anybody from him to Post Malone come in to, you know, I mean, just Jeff Daniels to just, you know, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland, you know, comes in there. I mean, just so many different people, um, you know, and, and I, you know, we have such great experiences with the celebrities. And I think one of the reasons is, you know, music is such a uniter with people, 
you know, it's something that you want to do. It's not something you have to do. So, like, when they're coming in the guitar shop, even if they're just looking around, they're in a good mood because they wanted to come to the guitar shop. You know, you mm -hmm. meet the people at a grocery store or at a doctor's office, they might kind of snap at you because they, they probably don't even want to be in the damn place anyway. So then you're, like, going up to them, you know, like, my some personal advice, you know, as far as, because I meet a lot of celebrities just the other night, you know, it's, I've, I've been producing uh, this uh, kid, his name's Beckett McDowell. By the way, you got to go check Beckett, Beckett out. He's a, he's, he's a very good talent, um, and I've been producing uh, producing him. He uh, is, is, is awesome, but he's the son of a really famous actor named Malcolm McDowell, who was in uh, Clockwork Orange. Uh, he was just in that movie with Mark Wahlberg that just came on Netflix, Father Stu. Oh, nice. He was on there, but he's been on everything. Like, uh, you know, Mal Malcolm's like a legendary actor, but, you know, I was playing a show, a little a intimate acoustic thing with Beckett the other night up in Ojai, which, by the way, Ojai is just gorgeous. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Ted Danson, I don't know if you know who Ted Danson is. He was a Sam Malone on Cheers. He was on The Good Place, the guy with the white hair, you know what I'm talking about? I um, I will. You would know Ted Danson. He's like he's legendary. You're a little young, so you know you'll you'll know him though. And then his wife, yeah. uh, Mary Steenburgen, who, uh -huh. and who she is, she was the mother on Elf, and also she uh -huh. was the mom on Step Brothers. Remember that lady? Yep, I do. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're married, but um, they they were there, and I'm just sitting there. I was playing this guitar, and I was sitting there like, you know, I'm playing with Malcolm McDowell's son, you know, which that that's cool on its own but like you know i know Malcolm on like a personal level so i've kind of like i'm not as like you know shell shocked anymore because you know it's like okay we just know each other but and then in walks you know these two like a-listers and you know they're just there to listen to us play you know because they mary used to be married to malcolm back in the day so you know but they, they have like kids together and stuff and uh you know oddly enough their um their, their son that they had together is married to phil collins daughter so <laughs> wow. it's, it's just a, it's weird how the how small the world is but you know um yeah there's la's full of that it's just how it is here <laughs> yeah i'm actually back in upstate new york right now it's like i don't even know if you can uh see my yep. my card but the trees are turning uh see that. turning red <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. so you said that you would like to do a tour yeah. Of your snazzy studio. Sure, yeah, yeah. You guys are going to see uh, Jack Ryan Sullivan's studio, and he has a ton of instruments. That is amazing. Dude, I've got more more guitars uh, than sense. Let's start uh, on the couch here. It's the black guard. It's the double neck. 12th string. That was sick. Let me see. Is there a way to... Oh, hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Okay. So that's... Uh, this guitar I don't talk about a lot. A lot of people don't know I have it. This was a Les Paul owned by Les Paul. They're heavy. They're beautiful though. They're... You, but this was Les, one of Les Paul's guitars, like his, the actual guy. Oh. Yeah. Wow. It was out of it was out of like the um, a long time ago. You know, it was out, it, he sold like thousands though when he died, so it wasn't like a huge huge deal. But it is still really cool. Yeah. Uh, here's our old Hummingbird that I have that I really like. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Dan Electro, Double Neck, there's a Gibson Classical here, uh, there's a 70s SG here, um, another Gibson Classical, this is a 68 Fender Telecaster, um, it's a Trini Lopez, it's the only um, guitar in here that's not mine, that's Beckett's guitar, um, but um, we'll keep going, it's a really cool 65 Fender Bassman, um, there's my Dan Electro uh, baritone. That little red piece of junk Epiphone guitar is actually my very first guitar. I kept that guitar. That was the first one I ever had. I have an Epiphone, too. Well, your Epiphone's a lot nicer, though. This one's like a really big piece. Um, so let's kind of go over here. There's another favorite of mine. It's a uh, uh, early 70s Les Paul Black Beauty, Les Paul Custom. Got a really cool 65, 66 strat in a very 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 rare color called capano peach mm -hmm. um then i've got another les paul recording i'm pretty obsessed with these guitars mm -hmm. um this guitar here is called a les paul 
custom 2550 anniversary. It was to commemorate the 25, 25th year that they made Les Paul guitars and Les Paul's 50th birthday. Um, and I've got this cool guitar. This is a GNL uh, Comanche. Um, it's just it's got the uh, split pickups in it. Uh, very cool guitar. Um, and this is just a reissue of the Blackguard that I have. Um, and then that is a Gibson L5S. It's a solid body. Uh, L5 it was their take on basically making a jazz guitar into a solid body. Um, this is a cool one. See Gibson uh, Firebird Seven. Well, Love yeah. that one. Uh, <laughs> oh, and here's uh, this is my one of my pedal steel guitars, the MSA Classic. That's a really cool one. Um, yeah. This guitar is a uh, '70s uh, Gibson ES355. I really, 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 really like that guitar. Um, that's just a five-string electric mandolin. It's a little cheap one made by Gold Tom, but a cool one. Um, I've got a anniversary jazz master here, which I really like. Um, really cool guitar. Um, this one is a big favorite of mine. This is a 1962-1963 Epiphone Sheraton. Um, uh, very rare. They only made 50 of these, and that was it. And the uh, cherry finish. It's a very rare guitar. Um, let's see here. Twenty. This is the... 25th um, anniversary Stratocaster that I have. It's a very, very, very cool guitar. Sorry, 50th anniversary Stratocaster, not 25th. Then we'll go up here. That's a Gibson Birdland and Blonde from 1969. It's very cool. Oh, here yeah. is my L, one of my L5s. It's an L5 CES. This one's a uh, Hutchins model L5, which is what you want. Um, this is my birth year guitar, so it was made in 1989. Um, that's why I have that. It's just a cool guitar. Beside it's another L5, but this one is from 1939. Um, it's a 17 inch. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful guitar. Um, I've got another hummingbird here. It's like an 80s hummingbird. I just really like the hummingbird guitars. And here's one of my favorite flat tops I have. It's a Martin Owen 42. Um, really cool. We're going to kind of scroll down a little bit. <laughs> This is a Gibson, it's a tenor banjo, four string, 19 frets from 1929. This is a little cheap ukulele. And then I've got my Gibson uh, five string. This is from 1931. It's a, it's a arch top. You can see the tone ring kind of raises up a little bit. Uh -huh. um, that's my old fiddle. And then we've got, I'm going to show you, I have three of these banjos. So you can see the gold ones here. These are very, 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 very rare and very, very, very valuable banjos. Um, these are called Bacon and Day and E Plus Ultra Number Sixes. All this is hand done. You see that? Wow, dude. <laughs> and you see. That's kind of insane, actually. That's, wow. that's ivory. And it was that's all carved by hand. It's kind of worn because these are from, this is from 1925. Wow. Um, I'm going to take it off the wall, though, because I want to show you a few things on it. The side of the rim. You see all the engraving? That's such a unique beauty. Wow. Um, and, uh, oh, the best part, the lion on the back. See the lion's head? Oh, I see it now. Yep. Oh, wow. And then yeah. even the back is engraved. Yeah. And that's real mother of pearl. It's very beautiful. I've got three of these banjos. I'm pretty obsessed with them. These are jazz banjos, though. They're not bluegrass banjos. Um, oh, a this is a 1922 Gibson F4 mandolin, a very cool guitar, or ba mandolin, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This one is mm -hmm. a very cheap guitar. It's a PVT-60. Now, why do I have this? Besides it sounding and playing really good and having a lot of tones, these are actually collectible, and they're an important part of guitar history because they were the very first guitars ever made with a CNC machine. You know, now they make guitars, all new guitars with CNC machines, but this was the first they ever did. And you can actually see it's just very sharp lines because that's what they had. They, they didn't have this crazy uh -huh. technology today. I, yeah, it looks, it looks pretty dang dope, I got to say. But um, I know, want one. <laughs> there's a champ here. Um, there's an old Gibson amp back here. That's a very interesting guitar. It's a 68 uh, neck with a what I think to be a black guard body. I'm not sure though. Um, I've got a, a 335 TD up here, which is really cool. Um, it's kind of got a bunch of pedals and all that good stuff too, though. Um, but uh, this is kind of, this is my console here. Um, 
Where I do a lot of composing. Uh, there's my guitar. I actually built that guitar. It's a pretty crazy one. Um, you built that? Oh, wow. I did. I did. And this one's really cool because, uh, hold on. It's got the uh, the B bender in the back. Wow, dude. Um, but we'll keep, is... uh, just kind of looking over here. I've got a really cool Gretsch um, Jet in Cadillac Green out of their custom shop that I really like. I love um, that. I love Transformers, too. I'm sure you can see <laughs> mm -hmm. my little Transformer up there. Nice. And there's a Jet King back there, which is a really cool guitar Ivan has made. And then we got over here, Flying V, Explorer, Thunderbird, the PV bass version, the Les Paul Triumph bass, which is the recording version. I got a P bass here that I built, and then I have a Telecaster <laughs> bass right here. Um, if you scroll down, I've got some Marshalls back in here. If you will go right way under here, I actually have a really cool Dr. Z. It's a, it's a Z-Rec. That's a really cool amp. I don't even really use that, though. And then I have a set of uh, Piano Black Lacquered Ludwigs from the 70s. I really like all the good cymbals. Lots of um, and yeah. another cool, one last cool guitar is this Grammar guitar here. I don't know if you ever heard of them or not. Um, the pickguard's really cool, but Heck this yeah. guitar, they all, they made less than a thousand. These were made in Nashville back in the sixties. Um, mm -hmm. It's a Brazilian rosewood guitar, though. Isn't that pretty? Oh yeah. They only they made less than a thousand. I think nine hundred ninety eight is how many they made. This guy named Billy Grammer made these guitars, and uh, he made them for like all the working musicians there. And they were he took basically the best of both worlds when it came to uh, Martin and Gibson, and that's what he did. So. That is but um, I do want to, if we can, just really quick, I want to give a shout out to my favorite amplifier company, Quilter. Heck, shout them out, yo. Quilter makes amazing solid state amps. They're like boutique quality. They sound, feel like tube amps. They're very light. They're very loud. They're warm. The perfect gigging amps. This is their bass amp that I have. Um, it's, uh, it's 800 watts and it weighs about 30 pounds. It's a, it's like a Ampeg SVT killer, but I have several of the quilters. I got two there. Um, I'm endorsed with them. Just full disclosure. There's another quilter here, and I've got another one. Their new Mach Three over there. Um, and then the the amp that I actually use for all my videos is the original uh, Micro Pro quilter. Wow. I actually like it. They don't make this model anymore, but it's got all the colors on the dials and everything. I I kind of dig that. Um, That's but uh, one last cool amp to talk about, so. 64 Fender Deluxe amp. I really like that one too. Wow. So, yeah, you're yeah I'm a, I've got a lot of crazy stuff. I, lo I love <laughs> it all though. So Like every guitarist dream collection, at least for me, you have like the vintage and the rare stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. And I can't believe, I actually did not know that you built your own instruments. That's crazy. Yeah, I might well, actually. Just this one and it's only because uh, also, you know, probably should give Seymour Duncan pickups a shout out because that's what all these are. I'm a big fan of that. This yeah. guitar is crazy. This is like the guitar that I could sell everything I have and still do everything I need to do with one guitar. This one does everything. I mean, I've got push pulls on everything, blend knobs, it's a five way switch. I've even got a drop D tuner on there, that's big tail piece, B bender. It's, just, it's got all the stuff. Wow, that is so epic. I might have to ask you a few follow-up questions over yeah. the, about your guitar building, so I'm sure they'll want to know about that. The guitar building. So epic. I do have a question in here. I want to remind you guys that I am done with my questions. We just had an epic studio tour, so if you have any questions, just write them down below. There is a questions tab, um, and then I guess we could go until 2.50 or so see okay we do have a question here already it says hi jack how long have you been playing and thoughts on robert fripp this is from ali z tanar filoli lili robert fripp i have to be honest i'm not uh i'm not privy to him so i have to kind of look him up um but how long have i been playing I'm 33 i started when i was 13 so 20 years now which is crazy to think about because i remember when i thought people that were playing for like five years was a long time <laughs> so. Very nice. that's about me that's about how long i've been playing yeah. 
are a little bit less. I want to say like four for Lee So I'm, but I'm like starting to play live and everything like that. So you're definitely an inspiration. I hope you know that for sure. And uh, I, I definitely hope we get to jam in person again sometime. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, let me know if anybody else has any questions. I will leave this open for another minute or so um, to see if there's anybody who would like to chat. Um, and to the lady or man, I'm sorry, I do not, <laughs> I cannot tell, says love from Utica, New York. From, yeah, boy, but bunny 4K. Thank you. I'm actually very close to Utica right now. Like 15 minutes. <laughs> but Jack is in California. Yeah, beautiful LA. It's gorgeous. A little, little hot today, but I'm not complaining because I moved here from Virginia after I left Nashville. So I'm uh, yeah. I was, uh, getting a little cold there. This says, could have just said Ilio. <laughs> I know. I, I cannot wait to replay that. The way I butchered his username, I said like Aloisi Tanar Filoy Lili. He's like, you could have just said Ilio. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's like going to be the best part of this, you guys. I'm telling you, me just butchering your usernames. I do apologize. <laughs> I do apologize. I'm so awkward. You could probably tell by now. But yeah, okay, you guys. Well, I, I will ask my own question there's no other snatchers i'm going to include this in the interview um just what what were a few steps to making that guitar to making that i mean what is your advice to us because <laughs> i would like to make a guitar well this guitar is very crude because i tried like 20 different variations of pickups and five to six bridges and different tuners and it's probably had about 10 different nicks on it and um different tail pieces my best piece of advice is be sure <laughs> that you like what you order that you like what you pick up you know i probably have in into this guitar probably over 10 grand in it because i just kept oh doing things and i've got it almost there it's still not quite there though. like there's still a couple little things I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's, I think though it's the neck. The neck's a really good neck. It's a Japanese fender neck, which they make some of the best ones. But I kind of want to try to get like a late 60s fender neck, 67 or 68 profile to put on it. It's the same one Brent Mason has on his guitars. And I really love the way his feel. So, you know, I may do that or I may just do a fret job on it and call it a day. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, just be sure of what you want because it gets very expensive really quick. Good advice. I feel like all of us guitarists can relate to that, even with like trying to get good tones and like trying it forever. You just chase sure. it forever. It's never ending thing, especially when you have your own home studio trying to record stuff. It's like a never ending endeavor for sure. There's always something to learn, always something to add for sure. I did see we had a few more folks joining. So if you would like to ask Jack a question, I am opening this up to you. But if not, we are we are probably going to conclude this interview. Jack is number two on um, Communicate, the new IG series. And then I will be turning this into a written article. So I can't wait to do that. Go through your answers and paraphrase them a bit. You gave right. very answers, so that's awesome. Really appreciate you coming yeah. on to that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'm going to let you jam or build guitars or whatever else your day entails. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you for coming on and doing this. I'll be reporting it to my IG, shouting out your your folks and everything. Thanks. They'll, they'll definitely appreciate it. And just one last thing, <laughs> go buy a cool ramp. They're really cool. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. You heard that. You heard that. Check go. out Jack's page for sure. All right. Thanks, man. See you later.